Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. Stephen United Methodist Church. I want to start out by saying thank you to Dave and Debbie. I had to send a panic message this morning that I was running behind, so they set the uh, sanctuary up and got everything ready without my assistance this morning, so thank you for helping me get through a hectic morning. I was up too late last night watching the Braves, I mean doing homework, and um, so anyway, um, this morning I had a little bit of technical difficulty getting my sermon in the order that I wanted it to be in, and so I was running behind anyway, and then on the way here comes car overheated, and we had to stop and take an Uber, so it's been one of those mornings, and I want to thank Dave and Debbie for helping me get through that, getting things set up, and anybody who may have helped them that I don't know about, thank you. Uh, we're glad you're here. Those of you who are viewing on real time on Facebook, we're glad you're watching us. Please send us an email or leave us a phone message with your email address so that we can send you a weekly bulletin which includes the lyrics to our hymns and the words to any readings that we're going to do. We want you at home to feel as much part of the congregation as we do when we're here in person. We do hope you'll find the opportunity to visit with us in person at some point. I want to remind everybody that next week is All Saints Sunday. So in your bulletin, you will find a form to fill out, listing anybody who you wish to have honored during all, our All Saints worship service. Those of you who are at home, may be too late to do this through the mail, but if you will send us an email with the list, we will be more than happy to include your request as well. You will find our phone number and our email address on our Facebook page at St. Stephen Church, Marietta, Georgia, and on YouTube at St. Stephen Today, Marietta, Georgia. You'll find all our contact information there. And like I say, we're glad to have you. We're glad you're participating in our worship service. Wanna, while I'm thanking people, I wanna thank God for a beautiful Sunday morning. It's not too hot. Dave said it was a little bit chilly for some of y'all, considering that we're running on half an air conditioner. To me, that's good news. But uh, hopefully we're getting it warmed up and everybody will be comfortable this morning. Please join us as we continue our worship with song.
before I get into our prayer request, there were a couple of other things that I wanted to mention. We have talked a little bit about making sure everybody knows that it's okay to sing as long as we're wearing masks and some other adjustments that were put in place during COVID. But those guidelines were approved by the body of the church council, and so therefore we can't really change anything without going back to the church council. Uh, so I would like us to have a council meeting soon to address this issue of singing. Also to address whether or not we should put hymnals back in the pews for everybody. Uh, at the time that all of this was changed, they were saying that inanimate objects could carry the virus and that we didn't need to be touching things that other people had touched. That has since been, according to the CDC, disproven and not an issue. So I, I don't think we're going to hurt anything or endanger anybody by making hymnals available for people to use when singing. But, like I say, we can't change any of our guidelines without the approval of the council. So hopefully Otis and I can get something scheduled and we can have an official uh, address of these questions. Um, so, this morning, for prayer requests, we're praying for Norris Jones. He has been going through some dental issues and that is preventing treatment of an AFib condition that he has. And I can tell you from personal experience that AFib can make a person feel really, really bad and, and total lacking of, of any kind of energy whatsoever. So we wanna pray for Norris. Glad to see the Polks here this morning. Hope that means that everybody is recovering and feeling better. Uh, but we're going to continue to pray for your recovery uh, as you address the various health issues that you've had. Sarah, we're glad to see you and glad that you have recovered from your heart attack. And uh, Floyd, we're glad to see you as well. We've missed you guys. Uh, let's see. We're still praying for Gene Smith. Mr. and Mrs. Stutchlick, Victor Blackstone, Bert Smith, Larry Cooper, Willie Neal Kane, Melissa Krugwig, Becky Sago, Margaret Simpson, Caroline, Frank Sawyer, Tom Williams, Margaret Hughes, John Reagan, Doug Wheatley, Kim, and no, that's not my Kim. Beverly Savage, Ann Clackham, Hayden, Barbara Casey, and Camilla Munion. We also want to pray for the continued refurbishing of our church. We want to pray for God's guidance. And we want to be grateful for all of the prayers that have been answered. Beverly's recovery is going well. She was back at church last week and, and is ahead of the schedule that I had in mind for her recovery. I'm, I'm glad that they're back and I want to be praising God for that as well. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for all of your many blessings. We need to be reminded on a regular basis that sometimes life's challenges, sometimes a little rain, sometimes a few obstacles are actually blessings in disguise and help us grow closer to you. We ask the comfort of your healing hand for all of those who are addressing health issues and also for those who are dealing with mental and emotional 
stress. We ask that you strengthen all of us as a congregation that we might be prepared to go into the community and reach out to those around us, being examples of your love and your grace. We ask that you allow us to share our testimony of your son and his sacrifice for us in whatever means is accordance with your will and to whoever you put before us. We ask guidance as our church makes decisions and we ask guidance for our leaders as they make decisions on our behalf. We ask that we be free from worry about the seeming chaos that surrounds us day after day. And to remember that your hand is at work and that your plan is in motion, even when we don't see it. We ask that you open our minds and hearts to the message that you have for us, that it may strengthen us and help us to access your wisdom in all that we do. We pray all of these things in the name of your precious Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If you would, please join me in the reading of our Statement of Faith, the Apostles' Creed. You should find that in your bulletin as well as in the United Methodist Hymnal on page 881. Those of you at home, as I said, if you can get a copy of our bulletin, you'll be able to read along with us. Please join me in our Statement of Faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. this morning is we walk by faith and not by sight. And yes, I'm sorry, the words are in your friend the bulletin. This is uh, not in the uh, Methodist
While we were singing that hymn, I was taken by the little note on our sheet that has the words and the music on it. At the bottom it says, guitar chords do not correspond with the keyboard harmony. I didn't even know that was possible. <laughs> Were you playing two different songs at one time? I've been trying to learn the guitar now for a couple of years and it never occurred to me that you could have two different harmonies for the same song. I guess I'll learn eventually. This morning our scripture comes from the epistle of Hebrews, chapter 7, verses 23 through 28. That's Hebrews 7, 23 through 28. Furthermore, the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who approach God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted from the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he has no need to offer sacrifices day after day for his own sins, and then for those of the people this he did once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priest those who are subject to weakness. But the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. The word of God for the people of God. So, have you ever run across a snippet of information or a saying or something in a book and you thought, I really don't understand, I want to know more about that, but you never bothered to go learn more about it? Maybe I'm the only one guilty of, of that. That happens to me occasionally. Or I make a half-hearted effort to find out, and it doesn't get me anywhere. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about something that falls into that category for me. It has bothered me from the first time I ever saw the name, and honestly, it continued to bother me until I wrote this sermon. All the evidence that we have would indicate that the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were actually written after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem by the Romans. Now, they don't speak directly of that having happened, but everything that archaeologists and historians can find would indicate that they were written after that event. Paul's letters in the book of Hebrews are different. They were written before the temple was destroyed. And the reason I'm bringing that up is that without the temple, there was no need for a high priest in Judaism at all. And the reason is that the job of the high priest was the administration and management of the temple. From the time the Hebrews left Egypt in the days of Moses and Aaron, 
when the temple was little more than a tent, a tent where the Ark of the Covenant was kept, and before which sacrifices to God were made on behalf of the people. The high priest was in charge of that. And the first high priest in that line was Aaron, Moses' brother. But eventually, after many years, under King Solomon, an actual brick and mortar or stone and mortar temple was built in Jerusalem. And so it became the job of the high priest to manage and administrate the functions of that temple. The high priest was chosen through the line of hereditary means, I guess. They all descended from Aaron. The priests themselves were all from the tribe of the Levites, and the high priest had to be a descendant from Aaron. Aside from managing the administration aspects of the temple, the other special duty of the high priest revolved around the repentance of sins through the sacrifice of animals. In fact, no one was allowed to enter the Holy of Holies, which was the room where the ark was kept behind a curtain except on Yom Kippur, which is also known as the Day of Atonement. And on that day only, the high priest was allowed to go into that room. And he had to make sacrifice, a blood sacrifice, in that room for the repentance of his own sin. Because until he was cleansed of his own sin, he could not intervene on behalf of the people for Yom Kippur because the Day of Atonement was the one day a year when the entire nation of Israel was to seek forgiveness of their sins through repentance and through sacrifice. So on that one day, the high priest was allowed to enter that room. In our text this morning, we read just a part of the larger story, drawing care comparisons between the men who were high priests and Jesus. But the comparison doesn't really begin with the Jewish high priests. If you go back in the same chapter of Hebrews, you find that the story begins with a man named Melchizedek. That guy has bothered me since the first day I read his name. And the reason is because out of nowhere, with no history of him even existing, he shows up in the book of Genesis and is called the high priest of the God, the high, the, yeah. he's called the high priest of God Almighty. Who is this guy? So according to Genesis, Lot, Abram's nephew was kidnapped by a consortium of kings who were at war with each other. He lived in the city of Sodom and he was kidnapped and held. And Abram got all of his men together and they went on a rescue mission to get Lot back. 
And in the night they divided their forces and attacked these kings and won the day and won Lot's freedom. And upon their return, they were met by Melchizedek. And he was the king of the town of Salem. But not only was he the king, he was also the high priest for their God. And he offered Abram bread and wine that he had blessed. So in return, Abram tithed from the goods and the wealth that had been captured during the battles to Melchizedek. Gave him 10% of everything. Who is this guy? He just comes riding in, hands out a piece of bread and some wine, and Abram is paying homage to him. Paying tithes to him. And he is not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible until you get to the book of Hebrews. So they make him seem really important and then he disappears. In the book of Hebrews, Jesus has been being compared to this man. He is called the high, the eternal high priest in the line of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was not of the line of Abram. He was not one of God's chosen people, the descendants of Abram. And yet Abram honored him. What is this all about? The actual story is kind of fascinating. A little bit complicated but I finally found some information Melchizedek was the king of Salem and he was the high priest of El Elyon evidence indicates that Salem was the predecessor on the same location of the city of Jerusalem. Melchizedek ruled that city and he was the most he was the high priest of El Elyon. Now Salem is the Canaanite name for the city of Jerusalem. And El Elyon is the mighty God of that group of Canaanites, which means that Abram was paying homage and tithes to a pagan king and a pagan high priest in the land of Canaan. Why did he do that? And why in the world would anybody compare Jesus to a pagan priest? In Jewish traditions, there is a writing, not part of our Bible or their Bible, called the Books of Enoch. And in the book, of second Enoch which is a text of apocalyptic genre it claims that Melchizedek is a descendant of Seth the third son of Adam and Eve Melchizedek would have actually been the grandson of Lamech or Lamech who was the brother of Noah According to this text, Melchizedek was 
born of a virgin, having no mother or father, and that he was set aside into heaven, eliminating the need for him to be on Noah's ark during the flood. According to this legend, God separated him out as an exception and protected him during the flood without putting him on that boat. Now, as far as we know, and even the, the Jews concur, the story is fiction. But it does lend itself to some interesting facts and some interesting comparisons. The author of Hebrews is writing to the Jewish Christians in Judea specifically. The Gentiles that Paul reached out to wouldn't have understood this story at all because they didn't know the history of ancient Israel. But Melchizedek was king of the people of Salem, also known as Jerusalem. He was the high priest of God Most High. He was saved from the flood by the direct hand of God and therefore eternal. He was born of a virgin. And by blessing bread and wine and then serving Abram, he set the pattern for Holy Communion. None of the men who served as high priest in the temple at Jerusalem could claim any of these things. They were human. They were subject to death. They served as high priest for a period of time, some longer, some shorter. They made mistakes, as all humans do. And then they passed away. And a new high priest was appointed. The line of high priest in Jerusalem, as I mentioned, is supposed to be hereditary. But somewhere around the second century BC, they were so corrupt that often the high priest was chosen by bribes being paid through dishonest means. And whoever would advance the corrupt profiteering that went on in the temple. So in Jesus' day, the high priest is a guy named Caiaphas. Those of us who've read the story of Jesus' arrest and trial have all heard of Caiaphas. He was the one that took Jesus to Pilate to be judged. So in Jesus' day, Caiaphas was responsible for the manage of, management of the temple. That would be the same temple where Jesus made a whip of ropes and drove the money changers out because they were stealing from the people. He told them that he was reclaiming the temple as a house of prayer. Well, who was in charge of those money changers and the goings on at the temple? Caiaphas. So before Jesus was ever arrested, Caiaphas had a personal grievance with him. That's the nature of the high priest's of the temple in Jerusalem. Now I've already given you the highlights of who Melchizedek was and what made him special and why he was compared to our Lord Jesus. Let's compare those facts to what we know about Jesus. Jesus was called King of the Jews whose capital was Jerusalem. 
So in a sense, he was king of the same city that Melchizedek was king of. Jesus was born from a virgin, the Virgin Mary. Jesus was the Son of God and therefore eternal. Jesus truly consecrated the sacrament of Holy Communion. As our Lord and Savior and head of the church universal, Jesus was and is the true high priest of God Most High. So this is the comparison that's being made in our verses this morning. I was tickled pink to finally have some understanding of who Melchizedek was and why he showed up in Genesis and then disappeared. I think it's a stretch for the author of Hebrews to call Jesus a high priest in the line of Melchizedek, but I understand at least now where that idea came from. There is one more comparison that we must make about Jesus that has nothing to do with Melchizedek. Aside from the management of the temple, the special function of the high priest was to intercede with God for the forgiveness of the sins of all the people of Israel. He would enter the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, make sacrifice for his own sins so that he could be considered ritually clean, and then he would make sacrifice for all of the people of Israel so that they could be right with God for another year. Let's compare that to Jesus. There's no corruption or dishonesty in the temple of Jesus. And only for that crucial moment just before his death was Jesus not in the presence of God, the Holy of Holies. And he sits today at the right hand of God until time for his return. Sinless and blameless, Jesus made sacrifice for himself but he made sacrifice of himself for all of the people, not just Jerusalem, not just Israel, but for all of the people, for the world and for us. Sinless, he didn't sacrifice an animal for our sins. He sacrificed himself for our sins. And he allowed himself to be separated from God for that brief period of time because it was required in order to pay the burden of all of our sins. Since the resurrection, the earthly high priest, whether a priest or an apostle or a pope or a bishop or an elder or a deacon or a pastor, etc., whatever you want to call us. They've all been human, all sinful, and sometimes corrupt.
As clergy, we may hear confessions from individuals. We may recommend penance. Or we may suggest ways that you can clean up your relationship with God. But we have no power to forgive your sins. First, because only God can do that. And second, because it's already been done. Jesus has already done that for us. Our part is just to accept it and allow Jesus to live through us. Do not seek for your Melchizedek or your Aaron or your Caiaphas. They cannot help you. Cast yourselves upon Jesus. Give thanks for the forgiveness that he has already bought for you. Fall to your knees and worship the true high priest to God Almighty. Amen? Amen. Closing hymn of invitation is Victory in Jesus. The words are in your bulletin.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace today and forevermore. Amen.